Uh, this morning I'm going to be uh, doing part 10 of uh, the verse by verse series we've been doing in 1 Peter. I want to go ahead and turn there to 1 Peter chapter, uh, t- chapter 3. Last week we did verse 1 through 7. This week we're going to be doing 8 through 14. And we'll probably touch on a little bit of a little bit more of 14 next week. And I'm going to be reading out of the King James and the New American Standard throughout the, the sermon just to kind of give a better perspective of the verse. Because some of these words that are used here, I mean, the King James, I, I use the King James in this, but honestly, some of the words, just the, the Old English equivalents are a little harder for us to understand. So looking at a more modern translation, um, even though a lot of people don't like that term, it helps us better understand what's being said in these verses in the Greek. It says here, 1 Peter 3, 8, it says here, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. The New American Standard says this, To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Um, I want to focus first on the be ye all of one mind, because that seems to be the, the, the hang-up here, because a lot of people will take this verse, or this one little phrase, and they assume that it means... We all have to be in agreement on every single thing, all at the same time, um, to be of one mind. That's some very high expectations because we all know that's impossible. I mean, no one can be all in agreement on everything, all at the same time, even husband and wives that are supposed to be one. Um, I'm sure we all can agree that uh, husband and wives don't always agree on everything 100% of the time, no matter what. Uh, So this be ye all of one mind is not, it's often portrayed and looked at in in such high expectations that it's almost like um, we we have to be of a hive consciousness, you know, all of one consciousness, which just doesn't make any sense uh, when we take it that way. There's many things that we can agree on that make us Christian, but there's also secondary issues that we can agree to disagree or have different opinions on that doesn't affect whether you're Christian or not. Um, There's very important doctrines that if you don't agree and you don't believe in, you're not Christian. But then on on the same field, there's other doctrines that we can agree to disagree on and still have the same intent and purpose for Christianity in the kingdom. And, um, and we're going to look at some examples of that in this, in this message. But taking the be ye all of one mind as we all have to be agreement just doesn't make much sense. It, it has to be something else. Uh, that is a very, very high expectation. For example, um, if someone denies Jesus being the Messiah, God in the flesh, obviously that is a big doctrine, major doctrine. Uh, if someone denies that, then we have to... <laughs> there's some big... That's a big doctrinal, it's a major doctrine in Christianity. If one denies it, they're not Christian. Um, or if someone rejects the laws of God, that basically we can do whatever we want. We can murder, we can steal, we can um, do, do whatever we want. There's no mo- moral law to keep us in check. Um, and, you know, another Jesus. You know, this is a, something we have to remember, too. Jesus is portrayed in Scripture as being a certain type of Jesus. One, there's a lot of religions like Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses that they teach another Jesus. They use the same word, but it's, if you look in Scripture, it's not the same Jesus. And we even are warned of that, of people preaching another Jesus. And um, if you believe in another Jesus that we can't find in Scripture, that's a, dis- a disqualification to be a Christian. Um, doesn't matter if you use the same word. You can say this post back here is Jesus, but and you can worship it. You can call it Jesus, but it's not Jesus, obviously. Um, 
there's just things that we have to come in agreement on to be Christians, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree on all things. I'm sure if we all sat down and looked at every belief we had, we could find disagreements, but that doesn't mean that we hate one another or we have to come into some kind of uh, disfellowship over it. Yes, there are things that do qualify that, but not everything like so many people like to. We were very good at dividing and not very good at uniting, unfortunately, as Christians. Another example, this is just one example of many, of a doctrine that different Christians can hold, but it doesn't disqualify them from being Christian. Some people believe in doing their Sabbath on Saturday versus Sunday. Some believe doing it on using the lunar calendar or whatever. Whatever they decide to do, however they decide to keep their Sabbath, does not disqualify them from being a Christian. There can be some agreeing to disagree there. Now, I will say doctrines such as that, local assemblies have to be in agreement, I mean, especially when it comes to what day you're going to assemble on. You know, that doesn't mean you disqualify people from being Christian, but if you have a local assembly and they're, you, half of them want to meet on Sunday and half of them want to meet on Saturday, uh, you're going to have an issue <laughs> uh, with that. It's not a doctrine that affects anyone's salvation or Christianity, but it is a logistical issue. Um, just like um, other things. So there's things that are just common sense. And uh, Colossians 2.16, just when it comes to, uh, we don't have to turn there, but just when it comes to Sabbaths and holy days and what people want to do, it, the Scriptures are very clear on that, that there is going to be some disagreement in that. Let's turn to John chapter... 17. John chapter 17. This is, uh, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed. Uh, we're going to look at verse 10. Uh, he prayed it right before His crucifixion, and He prayed it uh, for the, the apostles. Um, it says here, chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 10. It says here, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. Speaking of the apostles. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now this verse here is Jesus praying a prayer over the apostles that after he is gone out of this world that they are going to have be one one together obviously he didn't want them to leave and be fighting and uh, have infighting amongst them he wanted them to have unity and uh, then he goes on to extend this prayer not just the apostles but in verse 20 he extends it to us and it says here and I do not ask on behalf of these alone, speaking the apostles, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now Jesus prayed this prayer and He taught us to believe and pray in faith, so we have to believe that this is true. But does it mean what often is portrayed that it means, that we have to be kind of a hive mind or have to agree on everything? And No, I don't think it does. So what does this be one as Christians mean? Well, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to dig into it a little bit more. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. The New American Standard puts it this way. Therefore, if... 
excuse me, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And so often, Christians are not intent on one purpose. Um, they're not. We, as Christians, oftentimes will argue about the stupidest things and divide over the stupidest things when our enemies around us, they're intent on one purpose, and even they disagree on things amongst themselves. But they're intent on one purpose and main focus, and that is whatever their plans are. But oftentimes, Christians will divide and bicker among each other on some of the most minor issues. I mean, whatever we can name a long list of them, whatever it may be. When the major issues, the main issues, are often overlooked and never talked about. And it's not to say that the, in my opinion at least, that the minor issues are not important. Because to say they're not important is kind of to reject a lot of Scripture because these minor issues are brought up a lot in Scripture. But they're not important enough to divide and conquer over and are intent on one purpose through Jesus and His kingdom. There has, there's, it's not that extreme. We are to be an intent on one purpose in one mind, but we're not to divide over every little thing. So let's break this verse down a little bit. Just a few of the points that he makes here. He says here, we had to maintain the same love. And this is all part of being one, by the way, is what he's breaking down here. Maintaining the same love. Now, us here, is it possible for us to maintain the same love towards one another? Not just family love, but as a body of believers, a church body, whatever we want to call it. Is it possible for us to maintain that same love for one another? All of us equal love for one another in the way that Scripture lays out love with its relation with the law and, and everything else. We are to look out for one another like we would want ourselves to be looked, out, looked after. For example, if I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to murder you. I'm not going to burn your house down. I'm not going to be untrustworthy. I'm not going to lie. And if I do any of those things, then biblically... I don't love you, and vice versa. That is a form of love that's biblical. A lot of times Judeo-Christianity teaches love to be ooey-gooey and just kind of... It, it's an shell, empty shell. There's nothing in it. Um, and oftentimes people will say, I love you, and I, you know, this, this Christianity ooey-gooey love, but when you look at it, and compare it to the love laid out in Scripture, it's not, there's no value to it. There's no substance to it. So, it was Jesus that said in four, uh, John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, there we go. If we love Jesus, we'll keep His commandments and do what He told us to. And we know from a past message that I did a while back that loving God and loving our brother is the sum up of all the law. And he summed it up to where it's really easy to understand. I mean, if we love our brother, we love God, we're going to do the things that he wants us to do. So, we can maintain that same love. But what about uniting in spirit and intent on one purpose? Uh, King James says on one accord. The apostles, I think it's in Acts chapter 2, said they were intent on one purpose. They were all in one accord. Uh, I don't think it meant they were in a Honda either. Often That's a, a joke that's often thrown out there. But um, they were intent on one purpose. Do you think that meant that all the apostles, and I know in Acts 2 it talked about all the people they had baptized and that they had become Christian. Do you think that meant that all of them were on the same page and on one accord on everything? Do you think that the person that realized that they were, we talked about it a few weeks ago, the Judean, that Peter was preaching to that realized that they had crucified our Lord and they repented and they were baptized that day and they became a Christian. Do you think that they were as knowledgeable in all things as the Apostle Peter? No. I mean, we don't obtain knowledge the moment we become a Christian. We don't get 
something downloaded into our brain where we're up to speed on everything. I wish it was that easy, but it's not. Um, so no, they were not in one accord in that manner. They couldn't be. It would be impossible. So there's a difference. Uh, we, a while back we talked about how the Apostle Paul and Peter actually talked about it here in this book, how there's baby Christians. And the baby Christians are to drink the milk because they can't digest the meat. Well, right there, there's two types of Christians. We have a baby Christian that can only eat milk, and then we have a veteran Christian that can eat meat. Two types of Christians, two people washed in the blood, but they are not in one accord in the way that we interpret that verse often. They are divided. You know, one may understand something rather than the other, uh, better than the other. And, um, but they're both Christians. So there is some rank there, if you want to call it that. There is some difference. Um, I may understand something in Scripture better than someone else, and someone else may better better understand something in Scripture than me because they put in the time on that particular subject or that particular understanding. And um, I think we're all that way. I mean, I know for me, the more I study Scripture, the more I find out I don't know and how stupid I feel. Then you'll meet somebody that is very knowledgeable in something in Scripture and then not very knowledgeable in something else. Does that make them less of a Christian? No. But there is some difference there. We're not on one accord on that subject. And, like I said, understanding one, being one as being a high expectation of knowing everything and being on the same page is just, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. So, united in spirit and intent on one purpose, and then the one that really hangs everybody up is being of one mind. And, let's stop there for just a second. Intent on one purpose, before I move on. We can all be intent on one purpose for Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. We all want our children to grow up and be Christian and be good people and grow up in, in a world that is not so corrupt. We're intent on one purpose on all that. We, all, we want to see that future, but we may disagree on little things, but we're intent on that purpose, just like the disciples and the apostles were in the book of Acts. So, being of one mind. This is where everybody hangs up at and I kind of answered it back in the last one. We can have a baby Christian and a veteran Christian, two different walks, or same walk, but two different levels, and they're still Christian. But they're described in Scripture as being of one mind. That's significant. Um, this isn't rocket science. It's just a lot of times we read one mind and we, we make an, uh, an assumption on what it means. And it doesn't mean what we think it means. Um, the word here in Philippians for being a one mind, uh, it's not used anywhere else in Scripture in the Greek. Um, and it's not used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint. And um, it just means like-minded. It just means a like-minded person. Um, and the object in the Greek that the word means is harmony. Being har harmonious to someone and one another. And I think that's where the true meaning is. We can live among one another, not agree on everything, but still be harmonious to one another. And I know it's a cliche that's often used. We can agree to disagree on some things and not have to divide over it. We can bring harmony among one another in that way. And oftentimes, and this is just culturally, we, we just, we're really bad about it. When someone disagrees with you, you take it personally. You take it personally, and you think that they are, I don't know, maybe if you have one point and they have another and you disagree with them on it, uh, maybe that other person thinks that you think they're stupid because... And you may, I don't know. Um, it's very possible. But they take it personally. They take that disagreement as a personal offense. When a lot of times it's like, no, I, I just disagree with you. I think you're wrong. Um, and we, as our, uh, in, in our culture, we have lost the ability to not take that personally. And I've been there. I've taken things personally when people disagree with me. And it's taken me years to kind of like, well, we can all... Go, 
have our own opinion uh, on some things. And like I said, we're not, I'm not talking about major Christian doctrines. We're talking about things that are just not as important as the main intent and purpose of the kingdom in Jesus Christ. Um, this passage here, I think it's better, a better translation. In Philippians, let's see, not Philippians, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, not Hebrew, 1 Peter. Try to get my notes together. In 1 Peter 3 8, the New American Standard, instead of being of one mind, they used being harmonious to one another. I think that's a better translation because that is the underlining meaning is we are to be harmonious to one another. And if you read on at, right after, he said, Be ye all of one mind, it says, Having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. We as Christians a lot of times don't have compassion for one another. We often never put our us in the other person's shoes or in the other person's situation. But oftentimes we cast judgment and we lift ourselves higher than we're supposed to be because we're looking down at that person for whatever reason. We're not compassionate in any way. We cast judgment and think of the worst. Sometimes we think of the worst case scenario, we assume that's what's going on and we run with it. And we lift ourselves higher and that creates disunity as well. That's not having compassion on one another. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 16. And it's important to keep in mind, Peter is speaking to Christians. He is speaking to internal things going on in these letters that he's speaking to Christians. So this is Christian on Christian. This isn't Christian on heathen or Christian on non-Christian that he's speaking to. This is internal affairs, things that we're supposed to do within the body. Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says this, Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but con uh, condense to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own concrete, consecrate. New American Standard puts it this way, Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not be haughty. This is very important. He's not saying don't have a disagreement with somebody. He's not saying don't express your opinion. He's saying don't be haughty. Now how often have, and I know I'm just speaking for myself, how often have we met somebody that may be right, but they are so haughty and arrogant you wouldn't believe it even if they were right because of the way they're coming across. I have heard arguments from people years ago that they came off haughty and arrogant, and I rejected it. And years later, I'm like, well, they kind of had a point, but I would have never accepted it because of the, the way that it, it was coming across. We can be that way when we're presenting anything, the gospel, the directions on the road. I mean, we can come across where you don't trust that person because they're so arrogant and haughty. And it says here, but associate with the lowly. What he's describing here is don't elevate yourself in that manner. Do not be wise in your own estimation. How often are we wise in our own estimation? Not Scripture, but because we think we are. We're not using Scripture to estimate if we're wise or not. We're using our own estimation, our own judgment. And... As we all know, it's just we all know that that causes problems. That causes problems within a, a body of Christians. It causes body. It causes problems in a body of football fans. It doesn't matter what group of people that we're talking about. A haughty spirit that is wise in their own estimation is going to produce disunity. How often, and I, I'm pretty confident that I can speak for everybody here that we have met somebody that thinks they're holier than thou for something that they think that they're doing. It could be something as simple as they, or, they eat pork or don't eat pork, and they think because they don't eat pork, they're better than everybody else that doesn't eat pork. 
And I know everyone here, we don't eat pork. That's our decision. That's a whole other study. But I don't think of somebody that doesn't eat pork as being non-Christian for doing it. I think it's a very unwise decision, but that doesn't mean that I think that they uh, somehow I am holier because of that. Or someone that worships on Saturday, and they look at down all the people that worship on Sunday, or whatever calendar they use, because they worship on another day. They think they're holier than everybody. Uh, there's a lot of people that. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists think that if you worship on Sunday, you have the mark of the beast, 666 somehow, and that, you know, you're, you're damned and going to hell because of that. Um, but they're holier because they do it. And then, there's so many other things. I mean, I, I've, we've been around people that if you drink orange juice, you, you're a deadly sinner, but because they don't, they, they're holier. Something as stupid as that. Um, I'm not saying any of this stuff isn't important, it doesn't need to be discussed, but when you elevate yourself to the point of you are holier because of something you're doing, in that way, you're failing. Because that person may not even know what you're talking about. And you're coming off so haughty and arrogant that they'll never receive it, even if you are right. And you may be wrong. They may be wrong. Both of you may be wrong. But it all goes back to having compassion, not being haughty, not being arrogant, not lifting yourself higher than you're supposed to be. Because, see, our holiness and our righteousness comes from Jesus. And that doesn't mean we, we throw out the law and we, we throw out what we're supposed to do and how we live. Obviously not. But at the end of the day, that's where we get our righteousness and our holiness. Not from not drinking orange juice or not eating pork. Or whatever it may be. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 9. Now, oftentimes, people that have this attitude, they do exactly what Peter brings up here in verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are hither unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. What's he saying here? He's saying, don't... Render evil for evil if somebody does something to you. Don't render insult for insult because you are both called. He's speaking to Christians here. You're both called and you're inheriting the same blessing. New American Standard puts it this way. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. How often, and this is our fleshly nature, and I'm speaking for myself, not anybody else. When someone does something to us, we want to do what? Pay them back, right? Insult them. All the little kids here. Your brother hits you. What, what do you want to do? Hit them back, right? And nobody's speaking up. Um, <laughs> we want to pay them back. We want to, we want to revenge on them. We want to get, you know, he hit me, I want to hit him back with something harder next time. That's, that's not right. Uh, that, we're not supposed to do that. Oftentimes, adults, they do the same thing. When someone insults you, what do you want to do? You want to insult them back, right? Sometimes it goes even farther. Poke holes in his tires. I want to, you know, I'll talk about him behind his back. I'll show him. He won't do that again to me. If someone does something bad to you, whether it be an insult or whatever, we're not supposed to retake that same thing that they did to you and return it back to them. Because then that evil that they get sent to you or that insult, you are multiplying it. It was one, now it's two. And what if that person takes it and does it again? Now it's three times. Then what if someone sees you doing that and then they go and do it? Now it's four times, five times, six times. That doesn't build up the body. And remember, we're speaking to Christian to Christian here. He is saying, listen, y'all don't argue. If someone does you wrong, don't go and do it back to them. Because that just build, that just tears down. It doesn't build up. Oftentimes, 
that's what we do. We, we take an insult and we want to send an insult back. But within the body of Christ, that just tears everything up. That tears the, the community up. That tears the assembly up. If all of us here did that, we wouldn't, couldn't stand one another. Um, didn't matter how close we lived to each other. We wouldn't want to be around each other because, you know, he called me a you-know-what. I ought to call him a you-know-what. Now, we, you know, I, I, I had two uncles. They didn't speak with each other for 15 years. And they lived right across the road from one another over a dispute over a power line that ran through the other one's property. 15 years, brothers, right across the road. I mean, you could hear the other guy cough in the morning. I mean, there was no... When I say across the road, it wasn't pastures and pastures. It was very close, within 100 yards. And... Um, they got into it over something stupid, didn't speak to one, one another for 15 years. Then one day out of the blue, my other uncle just walked into the guy's house and sat on the couch. It made big news because he just walked in, sat on the couch, and started talking. We're not supposed to do that. It's not going to build anything up. We're just tearing down. And honestly, we're just feeding our own pride and our haughtiness and arrogance, really, when we do that. Um, now let's look at verse 10 through 12 of 1 Peter. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him askew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil." Peter here is quoting, uh, he's quoting from Psalms 34. Let's turn there real quick, and we're going to read it. And even though he's quoting from Psalms 34, and we just read it in Peter, it's good to go back and, and read these passages, because, and at least note them, because we see how much the New Testament writers are quoting from the Old Testament. Now, because Peter's quoting from the Greek Septuagint, I am going to read from the Septuagint, but it doesn't change too much in, uh, in the King James or New American Standard. Uh, Psalms 34, verse 12 through 16 says this, What man is there that desireth life, loving to see good days? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Turn away from evil, and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To destroy their memorial from the earth, and the righteous cried, and the Lord hearkened to them. It's interesting because we just got done reading a verse about not rendering evil for evil or insult for insult, and then Peter goes in and quotes a passage from the Old Testament talking about your tongue and basically keeping your tongue in check. And if we follow just the principles in this verse, we'd have so many problems in our life just go away because oftentimes our, our tongue gets us into a lot of trouble. People that have tongue issues, and we all do, some worse than others. We all sometimes say, I say sometimes, I, I say things all the time that I shouldn't have said. And, uh, and as much as we want to bring them back after they go out, they're, they're gone. But the first point in this verse is keeping thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Do you remember a few parts back in First Peter, he talked about not speaking guile. Or wickedness, bad things. How many times have we met somebody or we've been in that spirit where all we do is speak negative thoughts, wicked thoughts? And I may not, when I say wicked, it doesn't have to be just, you know, things, something that's dirty or bad, but just things that aren't uplifting, things that are not, not going to bring about joy and peace in your spirit or other people's spirit, but rather just negativity and, and bad things. Often those people that constantly do that, they're the saddest and they have the least peace. And we're all, we're all guilty of it, I'm pretty sure. We've all spoken bad things that we really shouldn't have said and they caused maybe some disheartening in yourself or someone else. And the point I want to make is the people that constantly do that 
are usually the people that are unhappy, they don't have any peace, they have issues. Sometimes they have trouble keeping a job down because nobody wants to be around them because they run their mouth all the time, they cause problems. I don't, every job I've ever worked at, there's always been somebody that just runs their mouth and is always causing problems and everybody knows it, you know, whether it be gossip, it's guile. It's negativity, it's all guile. And uh, their attitude is terrible. They tear down. They render evil for evil, insult for insult. They just encourage wickedness in, in a sense where nothing can flourish, nothing can be built upon anything in there. And we see all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that the tongue is, is directly connected to how things can be built and tear, tore down. One scripture that comes to mind is James 1.26. And uh, any verse, I don't care what verse it is, that has to do with the tongue are very hard verses to obey because the Scriptures indicate that the tongue is very hard to tame, untamable. Um, you, it, it, you have to gird it like a horse, and it's, it's very hard to keep in check. But James 1.26 says this, Any among you, excuse me, any man among you seem to be religious, or one could say righteous, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. I'm going to read it again. Let's think about it. Any man among you, or woman, seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, meaning that they don't care about what they say, they just let it run like a wild horse. But he deceiveth his own heart. So that means if you don't bridle with your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. You're deceiving yourself. A lot of times because they think you're something else, but you just keep running your mouth. And we all know you run your mouth too much, you just dig in a hole, and you're just sinking in it, and it gets harder and harder to dig yourself out. That man's religion is in vain. I mean, I, that's a hard, uh, a hard thing to truly uh, accomplished, but it has to be. Psalms 39.1, let's turn there. I'm going to look at a few verses just to, that kind of go back to this. Psalms 39.1. To the chief musician, even to Jedediah, Jedha, Jedhu Thai, Thun, excuse me, a psalm of David, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. This is interesting. That I sin not with my tongue. It means sins can ha be committed with your tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. There's that bridle again. While the wicked is before me. So what he's saying here is he's in a bridle his tongue while the wicked is before him. Now, there's lots of ways that that can be interpreted, but oftentimes when someone insults you, going back to 1 Peter, they're right before you, and your instinct is to insult them right back. Now, this verse has a lot of applications, so does that one, but I'm just using that as an example. We can sin with our tongue, we can, but we have to bridle it. Another one, it's a short one, Psalms 141, 3, verse 3. It says here, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Before my mouth. So he's praying that the Lord set a watch before his mouth. Keep the door of my lips. So back then they'd have people that kept the doors, that open and shut them. And what this psalm is saying is they're praying to God that the Lord watch over his mouth and keep the door. Watch it, hold it, secure it. Now, the second point in this verse, in 1 Peter, it says here, Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, we just followed the, 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 uh, the phrase about the tongue. And he says this, Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So we are to seek peace and pursue it and turn away from evil. Many times... We don't seek peace. There's a lot of people that they, they don't like peace. They may say they do, but they want chaos. They like chaos. They like destruction. And, and uh, many of those people are our people. 
blood kindred. They like it. Why? It's hard to understand. Some people like peace. We're instructed as Christians to pursue peace. Find it. Not to hunt down chaos and destruction, but we're to pursue peace and then find it. And I can't remember who it was, but a couple of weeks ago we were talking about uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And I don't know who said it, but somebody said that... Uh, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus wouldn't have got you in this mess to begin with. And that's a true statement because a lot of times our people, they'll pursue evil. They'll pursue things that they know are not good. And then they're surprised when things go badly. And although it's kind of funny, it's true. Jesus wouldn't have got himself in that situation to begin with. And now we're in that position and now we have to try to figure our, say, our way out of it. And then people say, well, what would Jesus do? Well, it's true. He wouldn't have got himself in that situation. And a lot of times, and I've known plenty of people, myself included, they'll seek out those bad things. And like I said, they're surprised when they ha it happens and they don't know what to do. But oftentimes they were given the answers. We have the answers right here. It just it takes some effort to understand them. So we can do that. We can, we can follow those things. We can not pursue the things that we know are going to hurt us. Um, it's hard. It's not an easy task, but it's something that we have to do. It says in verse 15 and 16 of Psalms 34, it says here, "...the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers." But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to destroy their memorial from the earth. The righteous cried, and the Lord hearkened to them. All Christians should understand and need to understand that if we sin, if we're bad, if we pursue wickedness and destruction, the Lord doesn't hear our prayers the same way He does when we're, we're behaving. Now, oftentimes, the funny thing is, is when we're in those states, we don't pray at all anyway. We're, we've pursued those things, and we don't pray. Not the way we should. But when we're in constant sin, and we're in the quicksand, so to speak, and it's, uh, it's getting uh, above our, our mouth, we can't cry out. And oftentimes, we have to dig ourselves out, or somebody has to help us dig, uh, dig ourselves out, because we can't. And uh, it says here that the Lord is against them that do evil. That means He's an adversary. He is an adversary against those that do w wicked or evil. And that goes for Christian and non-Christian. We, when we know better, especially, when we know better and we do things that are bad and wicked, the Lord is our adversary. He, he will stand against us and fight us. Now, it may be because He wants to turn us, or it may be because He wants to get us out of the way so we don't affect other people. That's between. That's only He knows. But He is our adversary when we do that. He's against us. He stands in our way. He did, you read the Old Testament, He did that a lot. King David, Solomon, the Lord was their adversary. He stood against them. And... If we're not pursuing the kingdom of God and His righteousness here on this earth in all the many ways that we can do that, we are standing in the way. We're, we're causing problems. We're not building. We're destroying. Um, and we are either builders or destroyers. That, that We can build up our family or we can destroy them. We can build up our community or we can destroy them. We can build up ourselves or we can destroy ourselves. There's really no in-between. There's no gray area. Um, it's either one or the other. Okay, now let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And we're going to read through 10 through 14. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Now, I do want to stop real quick and make this point. People that run their mouth a lot of times and don't bridle their tongue, it says here that he that will love life, he for he that will love life, and see good days. Oftentimes, people that run their mouth and are a problem, it's very high possibility at some point in the future they're going to meet physical, bodily harm from someone that just has had enough. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard people talk about him. He's going to meet the wrong person one day and he's going to mouth off to him. 
there's a real practical application here. If you love life, you'll bridle your tongue. You'll refrain from evil in your tongue. Okay, let's read it again. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him askew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and do not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. This is a true statement because we oftentimes, when we do the right thing, we are attacked, we, are, we suffer for righteousness' sake. And this can come in many forms. It can be anything from being talked bad about by a family member if you t because you believe a certain way and they're non-believers. It can be to the point of going to prison. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, it can be to the point of death in, in extreme cases. Oftentimes, Christians are abused and suffer because they're doing the right thing. And... The Apostle Peter here, which he should know, he saw a whole lot more persecution than we did, and then he ended up mart being a martyr himself. He's saying here, Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. How often today do we hear about all the things that the enemies of God are going to do to us? You know, we're Christians and you know, we're going to end up in concentration camps. We're going to end up dead. We're going to end up this. We're going to end up that. We're, you know, fear, 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 fear. I don't know how many times in Scripture, I think I talked about it a couple years ago, where it says, be not afraid or fear not is repeated over and over and over again. This isn't saying to be blind to the things going around us, but oftentimes people are afraid. You hear it. They're afraid. They, they'll do anything but read their Bible, but they're, they're into every new feardom that comes down the pike in the world today. And, and you can't keep up with it. You can't. Every news site in, in the world has some new thing, and it's daily, actually more than daily. It's hourly, something new going on. And um, sometimes if they're legitimate. A lot of times they're not. I mean, what was it, a couple months ago, all the, the farms burning down. And how by now we weren't going to have any food. I'm not saying there wasn't anything to it, but here we are. We still have food. Um, the, I won't go into all of it, but so many different things that were supposed to be the end of us by now, but they're not. But we're waiting for the big one. And that all may be true, but we, when we consume ourselves and we let fear come in our lives, we're not letting God guide us and control us. We are now letting ourself, our carnal fleshly nature of fear to control us. And... The Apostle Peter here is saying, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, be happy. But how many people do we know that are happy that just consume feardom and, and everything? I don't know one person that is truly happy if they consume all that all the time. Um, they're miserable. This is be not afraid. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Verse we all need to remember often. It says here, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. How many times in all of our lives here have we had something terrible happen where we just thought it was just unbearable, it was bad, we couldn't handle it, it was just going to be the end of us, but here we are. And then oftentimes, not always, 
we can see like 1% or 2% of how God took that and, and made it into good. He took that bad thing that we thought we weren't going to be able to bear, but He turned it into good. And oftentimes we don't get to see it. Maybe we see a glimpse of it, but we have no idea all the things that He has going on in that way, in that in His plan that affect other things that we'll just never be able to see. Um, one day, He can explain it all to us, but it's a blessing just to see a little bit of it. Um, the biggest testimony is we're here. Whatever thing we had in our past that we thought we weren't going to be able to bear, now we see that it was made for good. We're here. We're, we're, we bear through it. Um, that's something to remember. We should remember at all, th at all times, we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. The people that Peter was speaking about in this passage were called according to His purpose. They love God. We are called according to His purpose and we love God. That should comfort us. No matter what's going on, God has a plan. Doesn't matter how bad it is or, or what it may be, but He has a plan and we are a part of it. Don't know what that part is, but we can be satisfied and sleep better at night knowing that whatever it is, the guy that made everything has it under control and has it planned out for good to the point where we don't have to worry about it. Because if I had to worry about everything working and planning out, I, it'd be a mess. I don't want that responsibility. It is comforting knowing that God has everything planned and worked out for His good, whatever that may be. And it may be uncomfortable at times, but we can sleep at night knowing that that is what's going on and what's, what's going to happen. That's all I have this morning. Um, next week, we'll get into some more... <laughs> Verse 15 through uh, 22 are some interesting passages, and we'll get into those next week and talk about those. But for now, let's just uh, I pray that the words that I tried to get out this morning, that uh, they were a blessing and that uh, somebody can benefit from them. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for all the blessings You've given us, Lord. We just thank You for Your time to read Your Word, Lord, and study it and praise You and thank You, Lord. Please be with us, Lord, as we go out through this week, Lord, and let us be better this week than we were the last, and build upon the things that You've given us, Lord, and not tear anything down. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we thank You. Amen.